and I'm going to go ahead and um, start pulling through the questions for you, Josh. This one was asked very, very early in your presentation as you were just getting started, and it said, why is sandy soil not preferred? So I think some of you were talking about the Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, what I mean by that is just a very sandy soil where it's more prone for uh, nutrient leaching. But, I, I, you know, a silt, loam, et cetera, I, I see where you, why you're asking that question. Um, but, but what I meant by that is just a very sandy soil where you would be prone to more nutrient leaching. Thank you. And this question is coming from uh, Sally Knoll. And Sally is asking, you mentioned bio bags and roll off containers are required. Is the landfill or is this a landfill or renderer requirement or a requirement from a biosecurity standpoint? I would say that's from, you know, if USDA APHIS is, is involved or whatever state authority, it's, it's from a biosecurity standpoint. It, it would only be uh, a requirement for uh, uh, disease outbreak you know if, if it's uh, not a disease outbreak then I don't see that being an absolute requirement for that no awesome and then related to someone is could you describe the biobagging process was it used at layers um, what amendments in Winbrow okay, describe the biobagging process and then what was the process used at layer facilities what amendments and Winrow types so it's two separate questions if I'm understanding okay. correctly all right, I'll answer it the best that I can. I wasn't at a layer operation, but I, I did see some images and presentations from some of my colleagues. Um, the, the bio bag was placed in the roll-off container, and then they were actually adding the mortalities to it. They may add some uh, sawdust or wood shavings at the bottom to just absorb some of that leachate. And uh, then the, the bio bag sealed up, the roll-off container would then be uh, sent off to, to a landfill. Um, on the laying operations, essentially, the challenge there is you had birds in cages, and uh, you had to pull them from the cages, and then um, basically get them to that that windrow. And you know whatever carbon material they could get their hands on, uh, corn stover was very prevalent in in Iowa. So the the concept was still the same of building that Twinkie. You'd want to have that base uh, layer, and uh, then you know, you may be mixing in some manure and, and some uh, carcasses in the core of that and then capping it off with, uh, with some more corn. But the concept is the same regardless of what operation that, that we're on. Awesome, thanks. Hopefully that answered your question, Fred. Um, and Charles asks, if foam is used on the farm to top depopulate infected birds, will the foam impact composting? You addressed a little bit of it with the moisture after that question was asked, but if there mm -hmm. are there other things? No, it's uh, it's not impacting. It it will impact it from a moisture standpoint, and it can actually be beneficial. Um, the challenge is getting it equally distributed throughout the house. I don't mind having some foam in there because usually you're dealing with a dry, dusty material, so. So adding some moisture to it does get it more to that 50% moisture content that we are shooting for. So um, the challenge is getting contractors or producers or whomever to evenly distribute that because we really only have foam at one third of the house. Excellent. Um, and then another question is how about municipal sources of material or previously composted material as the carbon source? By municipal, I would assume lawn clippings or tree branches, things like that. I'm not sure. If you could find it in large enough supply, you would certainly need to go and, and look at the material and screen it. Um, you know, yes, you, you look at every option that you have, but you, you're going to have to send an expert out there to determine the suitability of it. And uh, Dr. Richard Austin, who I think is on this, is a is a good one to to ask about that. He's dealt with that quite a bit. But you're looking at any available resource that you do have. Most commonly, we're looking at, and what we have used has been wood shavings or corn stover, um, and that's at least that's what I'm more familiar with. 
So, thanks, Josh. And the next one is, um, Rick asks, do you replace the cap after you turn the pile? You do add some cap if there is exposed tissue. Now, there's some flexibility in this, and, and going back to that house where I showed you I had bukus of litter stacked up to the ceiling, I had enough poultry litter in there that we could cover that and, and uh, get all those carcasses covered up. So the, the short answer is yes, if there's any exposed tissue, um, that's what your goal is. Do I absolutely have to come in there and put a whole brand new cap, a blanket, the whole thing? Uh, I've, I've worked in situations where we just cover the tissue. That's what's required. Excellent. And uh, Rose asks, do you have an estimate on the time needed to remove the slats from a typical broiler breeder house? I don't, but uh, someone else that uh, on this call might, or on this webinar might, I don't know how many hours that would take. Greg Martin might, I see him. Okay, so it depends on whether they have the equipment to really um, go in quickly and move slats. Sometimes they're modular slats to where they can come in with a with an attachment to their bobcat or their skid steer and just pick up sections and move those off. Uh, we really don't need to move all the slats out of the way, but, you know, if you want to get more uh, manure and other nitrogen, uh, the best thing would be to remove all the slats as possible. Configuration of those houses varies from time to time. Sometimes you have um, a central nest box in the middle of the house, and so that can be problematic, and you might end up with two uh, wind rows in one house instead of one nice big one. I, I'd rather see a bigger one than a smaller one, but uh, sometimes you have to improvise as to your location. So it all depends on whether they have enough, uh, the type of slat and the equipment to move the slats. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And I see a comment from Chandler in the chat box on it. A good operator on a skid steer can remove in two hours. So hopefully that's helpful for you, Rose. And we're, yeah. we're a couple minutes past our one-hour time, but we're going to continue to go through the questions. Please feel free to stick around as long as you can. Hopefully, our um, Josh, you can stick around for a few more minutes and answer these questions. Yes. I'm putting my email at the bottom, too. Excellent. Case, uh, Excellent. And so these will be part of the recording, so if you have something else you need to get to, that's fine. We certainly will uh, um, try to get through these um, here, and they're great questions, so they're, we don't want to miss any of them. Um, Kevin um, asks, it looks like it's very hard to not drive on the fresh carbon material when composting in the barn. In, in the video, it looked like the skid loader was on the center section. Um, if you have a pile 12 to 15 feet wide, it looks like it would be hard to avoid driving on it. Can the litter and birds be piled on it without driving on it? Yes, they absolutely can. You, you need a skilled operator. Um, what we were looking at, 40-foot wide houses, and, and we would have enough room. It is a bit tight. Um, you've got to leave yourself room around those entryways. And uh, so what we would start doing after we have the base uh, laid down is to go in and clear us a large area around the entryway so that we can just start moving. And then essentially pick up material from along the side walls, go over and, and place it on that base while not driving up on it. We have to watch them closely because as they're peaking that pile and trying to get it uh, peaked up, they have a tendency to want to drive up on the sides, and we have to keep reminding them not, not to do that. Good information. Thank you. And, and Tommy says on your comment on worker safety, um, humidity, heat, and ammonia in the house, um, when and how should one ventilate before entering the houses for uh, management steps from building windrows to inspections or monitoring? And do you have any thoughts on, like, curtains versus fans versus just opening the doors? What was the, the, the first part of that question was, again? Well, when and how, which parts of the process did you actually want the building opened up to ventilate during the entire? Yeah, okay. Yeah, good question. Our, well, the methods that we used, we started opening up indoors, 
And, um, uh, <clears throat> well, um, we didn't have access to electronically raise and lower the curtains on, on one farm. And, uh, so what we had to do is open up the indoors. And by the time we moved from one house to the last house, we would come back in and then crank, hand crank the curtains down. I like to keep some minimum ventilation in there because you do get so much uh, ammonia built up. Uh, I have seen piles cool if we have left the curtains down. That was something that we debated back and forth on, you know, should the curtains stay up? Should they stay down? From an aer aerosolization standpoint, you'd want them up. From a worker safety ammonia standpoint, you got to have some ventilation in there. Um, but on most farms, you're just going to go in. You're going to go to uh, – <clears throat> electronically uh, lower the curtains and you move from one house to another and by the time you get to the in-house and come back to the first house uh, it should be well ventilated but I so that you don't get so much built up in the beginning I like to have some minimum ventilation in those houses very 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 important to have some policies on ventilation because that ammonia level does build up Excellent. and and we use the buddy system always We'd never enter a house by ourselves. Uh, those those levels can get very high. Great advice. Safety first. Um, and, and Steve asks, do you have any feedback on turkey composting from the Iowa operations? Has most of this material been land applied? And what results? I'm not sure what <clears throat> meant by results, but well, uh, I'll tell you what happened in Iowa. Um, there was, I think, unnecessary fear of uh, the end product being tainted. And um, it, there just needed to be more education as to this final product is a good nutrient source. So some of the stories I heard, you know, turkey litter was almost given away or uh, just paid, you know, for the trucking cost uh, to, to take it. but. In other cases, if the producer had enough land mass and, and, and uh, had some row crops, they would utilize it themselves. Uh, I'm not sure why there was such a concern there. This thing has gone through uh, two heat cycles at above 131. You know, it's EPA biosolid standards. And as you can see from the images, we formed a, a dark black humus product. So I guess my point in all this is proper education to the producer and the end buyer is, is very important. Looking at nutrient analysis is important and, and letting them understand that this is a valuable, not just soil amendment, but a fertilizer source. There was concern about all the carbon that was added to it. And I would remind people that we added a heck of a lot of nitrogen to those piles. So we have that, that center of that Twinkies, nothing but nitrogen. And yeah, we added some carbon, but guess what the carbon turns into? CO2, we break it down, we have CO2 come up from the pile. So we're also breaking down a lot of that carbon. You realize I'm never going to think of a Twinkie the same way again. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> helping you guys out from a health standpoint. <laughs> there you go. And in the chat I see, um, again, just going back to the slats, what about contamination concerns of the wood slats going outside of the building? Can it spread the virus? Yeah. Yeah, you know, here's what I've heard. Uh, I haven't done this, but uh, we talked about taking the slats <clears throat> and removing them and then wrapping them up in, in some type of plastic and, and dealing with that disinfection at a later period. Uh, to be honest with you, some of the old slats I was shown in the, in the images uh, I would debate whether or not we just want to burn them versus uh, uh, disinfecting all of those. But, uh, you know, I would, do, I would get them out of the house, wrap them up, and I've heard uh, instances where they've done that, and then you deal with the disinfection on them later. Greg, I believe you have something to add there? Yeah, I've seen it done where they actually had a person with a foamer on the uh, outside, and he was foaming a disinfectant on the uh, slats so that they were as they were being stacked outside they were dripping in foam and uh, that helped knock down whatever was there uh, for a period of time and then they went back and actually washed them and disinfected them again so they would stack them up kind of tarped them in place and wouldn't carry them too far because 
again, if we're considering, you know, aerosolization, we got to be careful of all this. And that kind of brings me to a couple of things. I was at a USDA uh, vet science uh, meeting in Pennsylvania just uh, this week. I saw Beth Woodenbrader on the, on the list of participants. She was there as well. And uh, one of the things that they were pushing, too, is the idea that every farm, in addition to having a avian flu uh, action plan for how they're going to handle the you know, depopulation and the, and the disposal and the decontamination or, or the virus elimination portion of, the, of that plan, that we'll, we'll add to that a strong biosecurity plan. And so everything that Josh was talking about, definitely hand in glove, we need to think about as we do this. And there's actually 14 steps to that plan that uh, have been proposed at uh, the National Poultry Improvement Plan that I think is going to be rolled out to uh, everything, everybody else. And so as we work through this, we almost have to have the, the, all the components together uh, to make it effective, because certainly we don't want to go through our disposal program and end up aerosolizing something that's going to move to somewhere else. If you think about it, we're not working in in a fishbowl. There's usually some other farm that might be close by to us, and so we don't want to impact if we can't if we can avoid it. In Iowa, we were actually seeing some farms that actually escaped uh, coming down with this this deadly disease. So if we can do a better job of compartmentalizing uh, an outbreak, the better off we can be. So the other thing, Josh, I thought that was great. The, the snowblower was a great idea. Uh, we actually in Pennsylvania have a lot of free stall barns uh, with, uh, with the dairy industry, and they actually make an attachment to the front of a loader that you can scoop up a, a, a load of shavings, and then it shoots out through the, through the side. Uh, to load the the stalls, so very similar to what you saw with your with your blower. So there's an option there as well. Go to your dairy dealer and ask for a free stall bedding shooter. Same idea. Cool. Yeah, that's great to know. The more options, the better. I'm sure. Awesome. Um, Bernice asks, how do you ensure the optimum temperature in the compost windrow has been maintained for three consecutive days in that two 14 day period? <clears throat> That's a process that takes a lot of time. We go in there with long stem thermometers, which we've calibrated prior to, and uh, we take uh, temperature readings uh, from 10 different flag spots, five on each side of the windrow, and we try to uh, you know, take a sample from that, that same area uh, each time where it's flagged. Uh, we take a, a 36 uh, inch reading, which is getting to the core of the pile, and an 18 inch reading. And uh, both of those uh, need to average out to be above 131. Um, I haven't really had issues with that um, getting to that temperature. Most of most of ours are in the mid to upper 130s. Excellent. And then uh, Fred asks if there's a centralized collection of manure on the site, does all of it need to be composted? That might apply more to layers, I would guess. Yeah. Um, I, I have seen operations where there was manure or litter stacked from previous flocks, and, and we weren't concerned with getting that composted. Our priority was to get those infected carcasses and that infected litter within the house. Now. There have been mortality compost piles with mortalities in them that potentially came from that flock, and, and as I mentioned, those do need to be addressed uh, because they could have the virus in them as well. But we usually don't focus our, our time and attention on those piles because they're usually from previous flocks. Thank you. And there's a comment in the chat. Um, Mentioned, glad that you said something about calibration because there was an issue in Indiana where their thermometers were not accurate coming out of the box, and that can be uh, that can absolutely really off. Yeah, and, and the calibration procedure is easy. You know, just stick it in a bucket of ice, ice and water, slurry. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
The other, the other thing I was going to say is that if there's ever a question, you know, the incident commander on site can ask for environmental swabbing. But I agree, if it's, if it's stored manure, usually the contact time hasn't been there with the live birds that were shedding the, the virus. But everything under the birds at the time would be suspect. And so a lot of times we're asked to not only compost the birds, but the feed and eggs, if there are eggs involved in this, in this outbreak. So you kind of have to play it by ear uh, as to the situation you're rolling into. Excellent, thank you. And Lisa asks if you recommend tarping over the windrow. No, I don't, because uh, you, you want you know proper airflow coming out. There, there might be some compost tarps that, that you would consider for outdoor composting, um, but for indoor composting, you, you, you wouldn't. Excellent. I think if the we we actually composted uh, ducks in a in a depopulation and uh, we were doing it in the middle of a rainstorm, if the pile is properly capped, it'll act as a uh, kind of as a uh, an umbrella to shed a lot of that water off. But if there's going to be uh, monsoon type rains or something like that, you could temporarily tarp with some sheeting and using what I call golf ball. Um, tie down points on that sheeting to keep it in place, but that's just to keep the pile from being flooded out. Uh, but for the most part, you do want air to roll through it. So there is compost fleece and other professionally, you know, available um, items that a farmer can have in place for normal composting that they can employ in a, an outbreak situation. Thank you. And then uh, another question was asked about worker safety and the uh, gases and what types of respirators are needed. You're going to see a difference um, based on whether it's a contractor and they, their OSHA policies and, and, uh, and USDA's policies. But, you know, USDA APHIS has their own policies uh, for what type of respirators to be used, and they are uh, distributed to uh, to their employees and staff and contractors, or well, consultants in this case for me. You're on mute, Jill. Sorry, and I think you already addressed this one, but um, at a layer facility with belts collection of the manure, the manure may have been collected over months, and does it all need to be treated? And I think you said it's mostly the immediate what's in contact yeah. with animals? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, and then the last question I have here is, what about litter amendments to keep ammonia down? Yeah, you know, I, I've given that some thought as well. Um, I, I think there's certainly potential from a standpoint of uh, controlling ammonia levels, uh, acidifying the, uh, the top of that, and the acidification process would also be a pathogen kill. Um, uh, process as well and uh, could control odors and detract flies. So uh, that's something I've given some thought to. Excellent. Okay, and then how difficult was it to get the carbon and were uh, nearby composting or mulching facilities used? Yeah, you, you start calling everybody you can to get carbon and uh, you know we, we look at every option and what I would typically do is uh, go visit the site and see what they had, not just uh, trust what they're telling us over the phone. And uh, once we identify something, uh, economics play a role as well. Uh, USDA APHIS is uh, interested, or the state authorities, or the companies are interested in how much they're going to be spending on this. So finding ways to save is important, but uh, you don't want to skimp on quality. And some of those pictures you saw earlier, uh, that's junk, and, and we can't use that. We can't have boards and uh, logs and <laughs> some of this stuff. So uh, quality control is, is crucial, and, and whatever is locally available, uh, you've got to consider the trucking cost. You know? So for this operation, the bag shaving seemed to work great because we could compress them. We saved a little money using that, and I didn't have as much tru truck traffic going on and off this farm. Would that work on every operation? No. And, and, you know, there's operations I'd use bulk uh, shavings or, or bulk carbon material, and, and that's mainly what I have used. But, you know, the, you always got to look outside of the box on this thing. 
Excellent. And this kind of drives home the point of, of having a, a, a avian flu plan for every farm because part of that would be the disposal portion where you would be looking at where can I get water, where can I get uh, composting material, carbon sources, and that way they'll be mapped out. You may even have some type of contractual thing to say that, okay, if I break, you're going to bring in three or four tractor trailer loads and drop them where I need them on my farm. And so having that prior plan is going to be critical, especially for larger commercial entities. The other thing we found out by going through this plan, we actually will see stumbling blocks. We had one farm, which a, a large layer facility with over 2 million birds. Their initial plan was to go ahead and bury the dead behind the farm. They were actually going to dig trenches and run the carcasses out to the trenches and cover them up. Well, once we got in touch with our soil conservation districts and our environmental protection agencies for the um, state, we found out that the farm is sitting on a major aquifer for a, a city. So, you, you know, looking at actual burial sites or if you're thinking of burial or other types of disposal, see, look, what, look and see what the ramifications of doing that action would be. And that's why I'm a big fan of composting. I think it's something that can be done very efficiently if properly planned. And so that's the whole idea. Think about how large your farm is and what it would take to put all those birds into a composting, uh, you know, a windrow. Planning ahead, never about Planning it. ahead, exactly. Excellent. And then uh, part of this question was also when you have to do, these out, do this outside, um, were was anything constructed to to capture any leachate or stormwater? You definitely need to do a site assessment. Uh, you don't want to build a, a windrow in a low lying area, something you know in a higher elevation. Uh, you need to consider uh, things such as uh, distance from waterways, et cetera. And uh, we have a lot of that information outlined in our standard operating procedure that I had mentioned before, and it's under a section called site assessment. So, um, you know, if you have grassed area with vegetation, um, bear in mind, I, if you build this thing properly, you're, you're not getting all this leachate coming from the side of it. The, the images with the leachate were improperly built piles. So that's why that base is, is so critical, going back to the base. That's that absorbent sponge, if you will, that's going to capture that leachate. And, um, but there are considerations uh, when doing a site assessment. Awesome, thank you. And there's just a couple of comments here in the chat box. Um, one didn't go to everybody, so I'm just gonna bring it out here. Talking about the older manure piles, um, it was mentioned that a lot of times those storage piles can reach 130 degrees on their own, um, and that's part of the mm -hmm. yeah. you know, risk mitigation there as well. Um, Good point. Yep. And then Tommy put in there about using just old growth from some prairie for a carbon source. It's a great idea, Tommy. Someone in Montana was thinking. Mm 